Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nintendo Week, the end of week podcast where we discuss Nintendo news, games, events, and so much more. Uh, my name is Colin McIsaac. I am the host of this podcast, and I am joined by Alex Plant. Hello. And Ben Lee Moreau. How's it going, everyone? And, uh, boy, we have got a big, meaty launch episode for you guys. So, you know, there's been a ton of stuff going on with Nintendo in the last week, so we have a lot to discuss. It's going to be a good launch episode. You guys feeling good? Let's get started. Really feeling it. Okay, (laughs) so at the beginning of the week, uh, Nintendo announced the final Club Nintendo Rewards. Uh, Club Nintendo is back online, finally, after a huge traffic surge and tons of error messages uh, for the service, you know, when people were trying to get all their stuff, but the rewards are here, uh, and there is a ton of stuff for Wii U, 3DS, and even Wii Virtual Console, WiiWare, DSiWare, and there's also physical rewards, including, uh, poster sets for the new Super Smash Bros., a Majora's Mask Jigsaw puzzle, and a Zelda-themed 3DS pouch, and lots more, so definitely check those out if you haven't already, and you like Club Nintendo rewards. Uh, We also have some clues about what the next rewards program may be. Those of you listening may know that Club Nintendo is shutting down later this year, um, and it's going to be replaced by a new rewards program. And our friends at the Tanuki actually discovered uh, quotes from last year that could indicate what they're planning. So Iwata says, Based on our account system, if we can offer flexible price points to consumers who meet certain conditions, we can create a situation where these consumers can enjoy our software at cheaper price points when they purchase more. So in other words, the more active you are in Nintendo's ecosystem, the less it will cost you to buy those games and to be a part of the ecosystem. Uh, so we know Nintendo's doing a lot with variable pricing, and the way that Iwata has said this sounds really like it could only be about a rewards program that's tied to a Nintendo Network ID. Uh, so do you guys have any specific thoughts on this well this falls in line with kind of their previous comments on their goals for nintendo network id they've talked about creating deeper relationships with customers through nintendo network id they've talked about customers creating better relationships with each other the recent push for digital content uh seems to kind of be happening at the same time as this this rewards system transition so it sounds like the the digital push is is going to go hand in hand with this this whatever this new reward system is. And they took the first big step towards this last year when they made it so that your uh, your eShop account is shared between 3DS and Wii U, and that all of your money can be used for both. If you put money on your Wii U, you can use it to buy 3DS games, and vice versa. So that'll make it much easier for them to implement a better reward system. Yeah, I agree. And they actually, I believe it was in that same update where they tied. Uh, eShop accounts to Club Nintendo and automatically register your eShop purchases to your Club Nintendo account. Um, And I think that there's some just really interesting potential for this way that they can incentivize people to buy more games um, by offering them for cheaper prices the more games you buy. Um, You know, that's like a model that no other company has tried before, and I don't really know what it could really lead to, but I think it's very interesting, especially um, regarding consumer loyalty and stuff like that. Well, you know, Ben brought up the whole cross-platform Nintendo Network ID uh, initiative from last year, and looking at the recent Smash Bros. launch, I think it's very conceivable that we could see something where they've offered kind of two alternate versions of a game, one on handheld, one on console, and if you buy the one on console, you'll get a discount on the one on handheld. Um, I think that'd be very appropriate for this kind of unified ecosystem that they're pushing for and would be a really nice way to debut a new rewards program. And we've seen a couple of uh, smaller, cheaper games uh, be available for cross-buy on Wii U and 3DS, where if you buy it on Wii U, then you can download it for free on 3DS. So that might be something they start pushing more Tipping in the future. Stars. Yeah, yeah those, di- those little digital-only <laughs> titles right. seem to be putting it in, in practice already. Right. Uh, so the final thing about Club Nintendo this week is that Flipnote Studio 3D is finally here. Uh, it came out in Japan in 2013, but due to what Nintendo called, uh, unexpectedly high, uh, consumer interest, they delayed the release of Flipnote Studio 3D in other regions, uh, and it's been a year and a half since then, but, uh, it's finally out, uh, and you can check your Club Nintendo to-do list, uh, for your download code. We have some new details, too, on Ironfall Invasion, uh, It's a third-person shooter by an indie game studio called VD Dev. Uh, You may know of Ironfall Invasion from the recent Nintendo Direct. It had its own little segment coming up. Uh, It's coming to the 3DS eShop later this month, and we have some new information on the title. Uh, Reading this from the article here on Gamnesia, 
Uh, players can expect 11 levels, including some pretty long ones, and various minigames. The story will involve traveling around the world to fend off 10 types of alien enemies. The main character, Jim, also has a female companion named Samantha, who will be playable in certain levels. Samantha levels limit you to a single gun and low ammo supply, forcing you to use different tactics in combat. Multiplayer will support six players online or locally. Having only six players allows the game to run smoothly at 60 frames per second and also lets developers create more focused arenas in the style of Quake or Goldeneye. And more details will be revealed soon. So you can read more about Ironfall Invasion at Gamnesia.com. What do you guys think? Uh, will it be a big hit? Uh, does its presence mean good things for Nintendo and indie developers going forward? I, I think it's a good sign to see something like this on a Nintendo platform because some of the people that have bought 3DS are going to be into it. You know, there, there's a lot of more of the... I don't like using this word, but the, the hardcore type gamers who want a more mature gaming experience. But I don't think it's going to be a big hit because I this isn't something that's going to make anyone rush out and buy a 3DS. And while there are some hardcore gamers on 3DS that would love this, it's it's not the it's not a majority of the demographic. This is going to appeal to a niche of maybe older Nintendo fans, and that's that's probably about it. I think it'll get pretty good reviews, but I don't I don't see this being a massive commercial success or anything like that. Mm. Uh, so we also have tons of information on Splatoon. Uh, most of you listening will be familiar with Splatoon. It's a Nintendo-made third-person shooter where you shoot ink around an arena and try to capture the most territory. Uh, so we have some info on the matchmaking system. There will only be human players involved um, online. There will be no CPU players, and the match will only start when there are eight human players connected. They will try to be matchmaking by skill so that you can have even matchups. But there's also more information. There's both good news and bad news. Uh, so we can start with the bad news, is that there's no voice chat, uh, which is especially frustrating for a team-based game with such a reliance on strategic elements. Well, yeah, that seems to be par for the course for Nintendo. They don't seem to like free, open voice chat, uh, especially during gameplay. I, at the same time, I'm, I'm curious to see how the dynamic will go online because they have so many of the sort of metrics you need to track while you're playing available to players on the gamepad. But uh, I think I don't think the game itself is going to miss voice chat so much as the players are going to miss voice chat. You know, like Alex said, it's it's just par for the course for Nintendo. Like even Mario Kart, you can you can talk to each other voice chat during like setting up matches, but when you're actually playing, it's just it's done. But that doesn't mean that it's it's a good thing or it's an acceptable thing just because it's what we're used to. Because this is a game that when it was originally trotted out, all they showed off was uh, five versus five online mode, and there's going to be offline modes and single player modes and whatnot. But this is a predominantly team based online game, so I think it's a mistake to leave voice chat out. Yeah, yeah, I I agree completely. Uh, but there is good news, though. Uh, there is a single-player, what they call hero mode, uh, and it's completely not what you'd expect. It's predominantly made of 3D platforming with a huge emphasis on human-to-squid transformations, that that very signature Splatoon uh, idea where you turn into a squid and swim around. Uh, so it sounds to me like they're really getting the most out of all the mechanics that Splatoon has to offer. So then Nintendo's YouTube creator program, as controversial as it is, is getting incredible numbers, uh, or at least too, too incredible for Nintendo to keep up with, which, to be fair, might not be saying much. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this new program and what it means, head over to Gamnesia. We've been covering it quite a lot, and uh, you should find everything you need to know about the program and why it's caused such a stir. But just in case people needed more to complain about with the YouTube creators program, it turns out that you cannot register your channel with this creators program if it has videos of games from other companies or if any Nintendo games that are not specifically on their approved list, which means that if you have videos of any of these games, you have to go in and register your videos one by one and you're limited only to the 60% revenue share, not the 70% that you could get if your channel is uh, registered on Nintendo's whitelist. I think this is likely because of copyright issues. They probably have the system set up in such a way that it can't account for videos that Nintendo doesn't have the right to monetize. Um, but it's just more red tape that's plaguing the program. And I, it's something I think they're going to have to address by structuring um, the way they review videos and channels and content differently. I don't think it's something that's impossible to fix, but um, I don't think it's like something that they made the conscious decision uh, to do. 
What do you guys think? Right. When it comes to registering the whole channel, it's not like Big Bad Nintendo sat down and said, oh, if you've got, you know, Uncharted on your channel, then, you know, we want to screw you over. It's like you said, they, they can't likely monetize an entire channel if it has videos from con- with containing content that don't belong to Nintendo. So, but the problem is the the way they've structured this, you just have to jump through so many hoops to get your your channel registered with Nintendo and then it's still less incentivized than if you would do a video for some other company. I mean, there are companies that are more strict with it than Nintendo. There are companies that are taking full advantage of YouTube's policies and just completely blocking videos. They're claiming 100% of the revenue. But that's not the majority of publishers right now. The majority of publishers are still letting you make your Let's Plays and what's not. So it's just, Nintendo, it's not a good PR move for Nintendo, I would say, to do this because you're already seeing a lot of famous Let's Players with millions of subscribers speaking out against it. And I think it's it's a good point that some of them have made that it's it's almost like Nintendo is losing free advertising by doing this. They're gaining money, but they're losing advertising. Right. I think it's ironic that you bring up uh, the point that it's essentially that this is a bad PR move um, because I feel like the channels uh, inadvertently become Nintendo PR vehicles. Uh, if they're registered for their system because uh, they're playing entirely by the rules of what games Nintendo wants to promote. Um, they're monetized for Nintendo. So I don't know. I just think that's that's interesting. Well, yeah, and I think both of your interpretations are spot on. And one of the reasons why I say that is if you look at the the list of approved games, you'll notice, and this kind of speaks to, first of all, the uh, what you were saying about they don't want to use uh, third-party content and what we're saying about how uh, it's it's too much red tape for fans uh, is Smash Bros. isn't on the list. Why? That doesn't make any sense. Because it has Mega Man and Sonic and other third-party oh. stuff. Uh, that, well, that's got to be the reason. They've, there's even I'm sure some major first-party games that are missing from it. Like, some of the Zelda games are missing. Some of the, I think pretty much all of the Pokemon games are missing. Well, Pokemon's also in this kind of sticky situation since right. Game Freak is technically not Nintendo. Right. Um, but the fact that the, the examples like, like Pokemon and Smash Bros. are missing show that they're not... And they've been they've been very uh, active in the communities for these games. Like they just uh, endorsed uh, Smash at at the what was that tournament called? Apex, uh, I think. Apex, yeah. So uh, it's it's not that they're trying to hide Smash Bros from the public eye and not let fans kind of have their own community events and things. It's there's there's got to be some legal implications. We also have new information for Pokémon Tournament, the upcoming crossover between Pokémon and Tekken. Battles will have a field phase and a dual phase in Pokémon Tournament. So the field phase is more like traditional Pokémon battles, actually. Uh, You see the battle from behind your Pokémon, that's the vantage point. Uh, You use long-distance moves to do damage to your opponent. But when you use certain moves, like grabbing, you transition into the dual phase. And the dual phase is what we've seen in, like, trailers and stuff. It's essentially traditional Tekken. Uh, You can attack, shield, or grab, and just like in Smash Bros, each of those three commands trumps another. So shielding trumps attacks, grabbing trumps shields, and uh, attacks trump grabs. We also have more info on support Pokemon. They can attack, they can interfere with your opponent, or they can buff your attacks. And if Pokin isn't enough Pokemon information for you, you can get the Johto starters in Pokemon Bank later this month. Uh, If you have access to Pokemon Bank, then between February 27th and November 30th of this year, so that's a long time frame, uh, you can get them. They have their hidden abilities, and you can transfer them to any Gen 6 game. So that's uh, Pokemon X, Y, Omega Ruby, or Alpha Sapphire. So a few days ago, we had a video presentation for Xenoblade Chronicles. Uh, That was February 6th. Alex, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I'm the Xenoblade expert or something. Um, <laughs> the I would say the the main focus of this presentation, which is not a Nintendo Direct, which I found very interesting, uh, was the game's world. Um, there are five main continents. Each of them kind of has its own theme. They're very familiar themes for the most part. There's a desert world. There's a forest world. There's a grassland world. Uh, a volcanic world. So it's basically Super Mario Bros. Well, with robots. Yes, but but with with sci <laughs> and with sci fi and an actual world and. Uh, you know, it's not and not as many shrooms, and not as many shrooms, and not as many blocks. Um, <laughs> but but we more swords. And we've heard and historically stuff. that the world of Xenoblade Chronicles X is supposed to be five times larger than the world of Xenoblade Chronicles, and so, it has five main continents. It has five main it. continents. So <laughs> oh, there you go. The, uh, 
the reasonable assumption would be that each of those continents is roughly the size of Xenoblade's world, mm-hmm. which means, you know, even though these themes are themes that we've sort of seen in other games before, the way that they'll be fleshed out in this new Xenoblade should be much deeper and much more diverse than most of the mm-hmm. worlds we've seen in past Nintendo games. Uh, so we also got a ton of news um, about some new features that Xenoblade Chronicles X has, uh, like online co-op, USB keyboard support. Alex, do you want to talk about that? Uh, online co-op is the big one because people have been speculating on that since uh, since they revealed the game, and you could make out a, a chat window in the initial trailer. Um, so, but it's nice to have it finally mm. confirmed. Uh, recently, we had a, a comment from one of the developers that they were they had added sort of non-traditional, uh, sort of more passive online experiences, similar to what we we've seen in games like Dark Souls or the Miiverse integration in Wind Waker HD, where you can uh, send messages to each other and share information. But they've confirmed that, yes, you will be able to go on quests with your friends online with up to four people uh, in a party at one time. So that's, as far as I can remember, that's that's a first for what would normally be a single-player-focused game on a Nintendo, a Nintendo platform. They've never had this level of online integration, uh, online co-op Well, not only before. on a Nintendo platform, in a Nintendo-published game, too. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, I find that very interesting. Yeah. Um, and for an RPG of this scale, it's just, uh, it's amazing that they, they were able to make it work technically. Because uh, this isn't like an MMORPG where where the quest gameplay is really segregated from uh, sort of wa- just wandering the world. Uh, this is a game where the it's an open world adventure and there just happen to be quests in it. And for the, right. for them to implement online and, and ha- be confident that it's working properly is, is a big step, mm-hmm. I think for a Nintendo published game. Uh, so we also learned about uh, some new characters, some concept art for the game and more. And there's a bundle, a Wii U bundle coming to Japan for Xenoblade Chronicles uh, X or cross. Apparently, uh, cross apparently Japan, it's called cross X, sometimes X, cross in Japan. Uh, whenever you see an X okay. in a title in Japan, it tends to be cross. Uh, they, but then they in, like America, but in America, it's, America it's pronounced it's, X. Yeah, it's just X in America. Huh. Okay, so we also got some news for Xenoblade Chronicles 3D. Um, that is, it is definitely coming to North America, and it's coming on April 10th. It also features Street Pass and Amiibo functionality. So this is a ton of news for the Xenoblade series, and we only have a limited amount of time here, so we can't break all of it down for you, but do check out Gamnesia.com for more information if you'd like to know more. And in fact, a fan made a version of the stream that is subtitled in English, so you can watch that if you if you want to watch the original video. So, probably the biggest news of the week, and it's probably news that every one of you listening has heard, is that the Wall Street Journal reports that Netflix is working on a Legend of Zelda series uh tv series i don't know if you call it tv it's on netflix some sort of media series it's it's the Um, new tv the new the new tv (laughs) new tv xl yes um (laughs) uh so the series is supposedly going to be very reminiscent of game of thrones but fun for the whole family it's currently looking for a writer so it will be a long time before it airs but there are two major things that we do not know one is if it's been pitched to nintendo yet uh, and if it hasn't, then it's very likely Nintendo will shut it down, given their history of how closely they protect their IP. And if it has, and Nintendo is on board with the project, it marks a huge shift in the way that Nintendo handles their IP. The other main thing is that Wall Street Journal doesn't explain what their source is. If they got this from a Netflix executive, that's one thing. But if this news comes from a series proposal document from someone lower down in the company, it's a whole other story. Um, so we don't even really know that Netflix is actually on board with this project either. But even so, the internet has exploded, people are getting excited. Our sister site Zelda Informer is having a field day thinking of everything this could mean for the Zelda series, so if you want to read some more speculation about the Netflix series itself, or what that might mean for the future of the Zelda franchise as a whole, be sure to visit Zelda Informer and check that out as well. Yeah, so I, I know you were saying that Nintendo typically plays their cards close to their chest as far as licensing goes, but I, th- I think a Iwata... It was about a year ago, or maybe a little more, made a comment about how they're going to be a little bit looser with their licensing. Uh, I thought that might have meant merchandising primarily, but we've we've seen game adaptations too. So I think it's very possible that uh, they they are kind of looking to expand that licensing push into TV and not just into games. We'll see yeah, though. It's possible. I don't I don't know that I don't know that Nintendo would be comfortable going that far just yet though. Uh, but we'll see. Also in multimedia news, Nintendo tried to gain the adaption rights to Harry Potter all the way back in 1998. 
back when the Harry Potter license was being sold off in 98, Nintendo was a major party that was trying to acquire the adaption rights. Um, one of their internal studios halted all work on all their other projects. They scrambled to create pitches for Harry Potter video games, including a third-person adventure game, which, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the genre, that's essentially like Zelda, and a video game based on Quidditch. Uh, they would have released games to coincide with each new Harry Potter book that would come out, and they even hired an artist from Marvel to work on the concept art from the game, and if you're interested, you can go see that over at Gamnesia.com. Um, ultimately, Nintendo was outbid by larger companies like Disney and Universal, and the rights were finally sold off to Warner Brothers, uh, which has led to, you know, obviously the explosion of the film franchise and, um, you know, Harry Potter as <laughs> really what it's known as today. But what I think is really interesting here in this story is twofold. The good news is that Harry Potter could have actually been a part of the Nintendo canon. Uh, that the Harry Potter franchise would have been like a Nintendo franchise. And the bad, albeit more interesting news, is that if Nintendo had bought the license, Harry Potter most likely would never have been adapted into a film series and thus wouldn't have become the behemoth of a cultural phenomenon that it is today. So, so there's kind of this interesting way that you know, if, if this had happened, Harry Potter would be a part of the Nintendo family, but also it wouldn't be the crazy popular thing that it is. It would have... It would have been transfigured into something else, you might say. Um, <laughs> what interests me about this whole story is you have Nintendo bidding on a Western property, and they're hiring someone from Marvel, which is a Western property. And this is in 1998. Yeah, this is in... Well, like... in 98, uh, the West was their, their major player. I think N64 was only doing well in America, and GameCube was even worse. Oh, was it? Um, so oh. it, from the timeline perspective, it, it makes sense to me. But um, when you look at the history since then, it seems they've been focusing more on Japanese stuff uh, and publishing you know, Japanese games. So it, it sounds to me like they've tried to break into this sort of world of Western IP or Western style properties, but they've been unsuccessful. So they've sort of given up on it. The thing that interests me is if they had acquired these rights around 1998, that means they would have started pumping out games right around the time that the GameCube came out. And I just, I can't help but wonder how much history would be different if Harry Potter was a GameCube exclusive. You know, I wonder how many other developers would have been interested in getting on board with GameCube, which, you know, was a system that saw very, very little support outside of Nintendo first party games. If if Harry Potter had been on there, if there would have been more support from other developers. That is an interesting question, um, though I don't know that it really would have changed much because, again, it wouldn't have been... Um... I, I think that the film series is really what launched Harry Potter into such um, such a wild success. Well, certainly a long-term Nintendo... success, yeah. Right. Uh, so I don't know that without the films, an, a GameCube-exclusive game from Harry Potter would have really made much difference. That's a good point. But, well, uh, it you know, still would have been on GameCube. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting question. I'm sure the Quidditch video games would have been better made by Nintendo. Yeah. Than, <laughs> than by EA. And finally, uh, a new Smash Bros. 3DS update is available now, version 1.0.5, and it adds lots of new features. Uh, it adds amiibo functionality and sharing features for replays, snapshots, and more. Uh, amiibo functionality is the same as it is on the Wii U version of the game, uh, and you can even use amiibo that you've trained up in the Wii U game on your 3DS. Of course, this amiibo stuff only works when playing on the new Nintendo 3DS, but if you aren't planning to upgrade to the new system, a peripheral device that lets you use Amiibo with older models of the 3DS is coming out later this year. Uh, the weird thing about this update is that you can no longer view any replays saved from older versions of the game, which has led to people speculating that there was balance patching for the characters, um, but the details of like what was actually rebalanced, if anything was rebalanced, uh, have not yet been sorted out. A side note on the issue of replays. Uh, the recent update for the Wii U version, which uh, added more A-player Smash stages, also, uh, I think, blocked your old replays. So I think we can expect that to be just a constant uh, with all their updates, regardless of what they include. Now, didn't Nintendo say they weren't intending to add any more balance patches? Right, but the question is why replays would be completely disabled from older versions of the game if there wasn't 
uh, if there weren't some changes to the balance of characters. Because the way that replays work in Smash Bros. is it recreates the data of the battle and regenerates what happens in the battle. It doesn't save it as like a video. It saves it as it saves it as something that it re-renders every time you view the replay. Right, right. So the only reason that I can think of and that a lot of other people in the Smash community can think of that it would render replays unviewable is that there was some change to the way, even if it was like one character, one attack gets changed by half a percent, even if it's something as small as that, uh, that's something that would completely disable any replays for that character because the game wouldn't be able to recreate what happened in the battle. Well, um, and, it, and it may be something where amiibo data, for example, uh, changes the way character data is uh, loaded in some way, in some substantial way. Uh, and I, I say that because Smash Bros. seems to be very, uh, especially on 3DS, seems to be very uh, heavily customized and is really getting all the juice it can out of the system so it may be that mm-hmm. in order to accommodate amiibo they needed to make some substantial change to the way data is right. processed across the entire game but i don't know i can only speculate so the final piece of news is uh something that actually came out just earlier today former staffers from rare have teamed back up they formed an indie company called platonic studios and they're developing a spiritual successor to banjo kazooie this news isn't strictly nintendo but because of how embedded banjo kazooie is to this sort of nintendo fandom we feel it's important to bring up but uh we're not going to be talking about it a lot so you can visit gamnesia.com if you'd like to know more but if you think we should talk about it on this podcast, then definitely send us an email. At the end of the episode, we'll explain uh, how you can do all that. Uh, and let us know that you want us to talk about Project Ukulele is its name. But we're calling it Mingi Jonjo. I said Minji Jongo, but I don't. Who knows? Who knows? There's some upcoming dates, though, to keep in mind if you're a Nintendo fan. February 17th is Nintendo's financial meeting. Uh, their investor briefing, I believe it is. Uh, Iwata's gonna go up and say some things and go home. People are gonna exactly. ask him why he doesn't do put games on Drake cell phones. Exactly. <laughs> more than one. Many, many more than one. <laughs> oh yeah, and when's uh, your but... newest platform coming out? They'll ask that too. And on February 12th, this Thursday, there will be a Majora's Mask 3D live stream. Um, and that could have some announcements about physical products. I wouldn't get your hopes up, but you know, it, it's something to keep an eye out for. There may be some news in there. And just as an announcement to people who are thinking of getting the new Nintendo 3DS when it comes out this Friday, be sure to get your pre-orders in ASAP because the red new Nintendo 3DS has already sold out at GameStop and judging by Nintendo's recent history, other colors and other retailers are likely not very far behind. Oh, and an addendum to that, I heard earlier today that they actually have sold out all of their uh, new 3DS stock online at GameStop. Uh, So so, yes, it's happening. (laughs) <laughs> it's Nintendo's happening. Nintendoing and GameStop is I just see that Ron Paul gif. It's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for this week's recap, but there is one piece of news that we have not yet discussed. Stay tuned because after the break, we are going to talk about Nintendo's comeback strategy and what games we think they should remake for Nintendo 3DS. 